Hello and welcome to Snyder's Return, a tabletop roleplay podcast. My guest today has helped give birth to new games, adding a sense of discovery and flow to our gaming tables. If we get on deck and chase the water dragon down past the aisles, we'll find ourselves down in the creek where beings of myth beyond belief reside. Get into grips with game design, crowdfunding, accessibility and inclusivity is Hatchlings Games game designer, writer, content creator and voiceover actor, Catherine Oxenham. Catherine, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Catherine, uh, before we go into some of the things that I've alluded to there uh, in the introduction, how did you get into tabletop role-playing games, please? Well, it was probably during my university um, time, which is also when I met Rich, and he sort of introduced me to a group of friends, and we were all sort of living around the same area in Bath, and all of us pretty dramatic types, Um, so I studied drama at uni, Um, Rich was doing creative writing, and um, yeah, we all sort of fell in with this group, and they had been playing D&D for ages, Um, Mm -hmm. and I'd heard of it vaguely, but had never really tried it, but being, you know, sort of interested in drama and things like that and theatre, I thought I'd give it a go, and we all sort of gathered around and in her kitchen around this big big wooden table and it was brilliant because we had all the you know the character sheets and the dice and it was just like this whole new thing that I'd never known existed before Mm. and I was just sort of hooked from then and we we played with that group for well all the way through uni basically Um, and then we just carried on finding new groups and doing our own thing and yeah that's how it started amazing Uh, so from your early play then is there any character that you you played you sort of embodied it uh, oh. in, in that aspect that, that has sort of stayed with you maybe it's a first one or one you had a particularly dramatic moment or arc with i i played a ranger and i want to say that her name was ariadne although that could be wrong but i always tended to lean towards either rangers or um magic users um but but ariadne i think was was a ranger and she was she was awesome and i i feel like i was sort of trying to channel legolas in a way you know sort of when i was playing explore the rings as mm. favorite so but there was a moment when we were sort of scouting our location and i decided to go up onto the top of a building and i was hiding behind um something and then um i i think i actually failed quite badly um at <laughs> one check and i can't remember which one it was but it was one that i shouldn't have failed at as a ranger so mm. it was a really dreadful role and i think i fell through the roof um <laughs> of the of the building <laughs> um so you know it, it was kind of definitely a humbling moment because i I've, I've been you know sort of oh my ranger's so cool and she's got all these athletics and stuff like that and yeah and then it just miserably failed during that that little session there um so that was that was the time I really remember just because I think that was one of my most memorable failures um and I think Mm. often they stick with you sometimes more than the successes but in like a really fun sort of way um I think failure often lends a lot of interest to a game to be honest um certainly moves yeah I mean certainly moves a a story in a new direction not necessarily a, a uh yeah it certainly <laughs> Somebody moves the story direction. forward yeah. uh but for but for picking rangers me and you are new best friends i'm just going to say that <laughs> so so uh, you sort of play with this uh initially the, the sort of the uh, university group and moved through group to group to group uh yeah. D initially where else has your ttrpg turn taking you with respect to the games you you played and experienced and and enjoyed if if you're willing to yeah, share well Actually, I hate to say it, but it's only been fairly recently since I've sort of branched out from um, from D and D, and it was basically mm. when we started uh, the company, and, and Rich came up with the idea for Inspirals. When was that? That was back in sort of twenty 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 or twenty nineteen even. Um, and up to that point, I'd really only played D and D. I know Richard, you know, sort of been branching out a bit, but I'd pretty much stayed. I'm the sort of person who likes to stay where I'm comfortable a lot of the mm. time and it takes a lot for me to sort of branch out into new areas. So I was kind of um, thrust into it with Inspirals and obviously doing all <laughs> this uh, new research and all these different mechanics and mm. Rich was an absolute powerhouse just, you know, going through and he he knew loads and he taught himself loads. Um, so since then, since, since we sort of started up Hatchlings, um, I've sort of messed around with a few different... Um, different mechanics I'm, I'm really liking the powered by the apocalypse at the moment mm. i think that's that's become one of my new favorites the playbook idea 
um, is brilliant. And I really get on with that. We're doing a Blades in the Dark um, session at the moment with a group of friends online. Just started that and I'm loving it. I think it's brilliant. I'm, I really want to try Monster of the Week at some point as well. Um, mm. What more? Yeah, there's there's quite a few. We've got a really big collection actually on the bookshelf. <laughs> so it's just finding the groups to play with. But at the moment, I've been sort of making my way through just reading them as part of the research and things. Mm. So, but yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to just exploring loads of new new systems now. I think I've got the bug for it. So, but yeah, it's it's fairly recent. I would say D and D's been a big thing for me for quite a long time. So, yeah, absolutely, yeah. and uh, no no issues with that at all. <laughs> of course, of course. Uh, you mentioned there, Powered by the Apocalypse, which mm. comes up later in, in one of the games. We'll, we'll sort of touch on and discuss, and I alluded to yeah. in the introduction. Um, Blades in the Dark, though, I'm intrigued. Is it? Is it within Dustborn, and, and are you which, which playbook uh, of the crew of you sort of? So I'm playing a Whisper, um, mm. which was immediately the one that stuck out to me. And again, like I think it's you know a magic sort of eerie, creepy character, which I I really like the look of. Mm. Um, we've been quite lucky, and all of our group have actually initially leaned towards different playbooks. So we've got a really nice sort of balanced party. Um, but obviously the point is with Blades in the Dark, it's very flexible. You can pick different parts and different strengths and stuff like that. So your character is not mm. limited by the playbook, which I which I like as well. Um, and it's just a lot of fun, you know, just this sort of um, Victorian steampunky um, sort of skulking through the shadows, um, committing crimes in like fog and dark <laughs> everywhere. Like it's very mm. obviously very different to what we as a company make because we're in all ages and we sort of tend to make on the lighter side. Mm. Um, so playing something like Blades is just just a lot of fun, a lot of fun. Um, as I say, we're only two sessions or so in at the moment, but... I can see it becoming a new favourite quite quickly. Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic game by by John Harper. Uh, mm. So, but rewinding out, so that's where we are now and moving forward with, with your own play experience. Rewinding the clock, you mentioned um, sort of only really getting new experiences when uh, you and uh, Rich and the, the Hatchlings Games Company, as it were, began uh, creating Inspirals. Mm. With respect to that and sort of the books that have followed what has been what has been one of your biggest learning curves as a a writer and a content creator for the game and what has been your most favorite piece of law or um i'd say law for this question that that has been created in in parallel to the game oh interesting so in terms of learning curves i think there have actually been too many to count we seem to be on such a twisty like bending road at the moment i think that's just the nature of it though like rich and i we've never started a business before we've mm. never done anything like that before um both of us have worked in care beforehand so um in terms of that Rich and I sort of naively assumed we'd be just making games and doing what we love and that would be it but of course you've got all the other side of stuff that mm. no one ever talks about like you know sort of the taxes and sorting things out with the accountants and all that sort of stuff so that's been a massive massive learning curve just to try and sort of get it off the off the ground um mm. as any new business i think would um and in terms of actually designing games you know just balancing them balancing the mechanics making sure it all works and um, that's where play testing comes in mm -hmm. um but yeah, so they're, they're all the they're all the like new things we've had to learn. Um, in terms of law, I think I just think the whole idea of um, having a sort of an alternate um, an alternate UK in Inspirals, you know, with sort of these mythical creatures, and the fact that it was the um, it was Arthur and Guinevere, you know, sort of visiting and everything, and linking it back to that Celtic um, sort mm -hmm. of folklore and the Celtic law surrounding all these different mythical creatures which we took a lot of inspiration from like the knockers um, and the piskies and stuff like that that's all sort of based on that celtic sort of side of things and i think i really like that because both of our families actually come from cornwall so we're sort of um very very close to that sort of um aspect of uk um mm. history um and so when he came up with the idea of like oh yeah well, let's make it celtic i was like oh yeah that's, that's good. <laughs> let's do that so yeah i mean it's 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 already got its own law it's a deep law in itself and we mm. just sort of tapped into that i think um and that's my favorite part the sort of nature and mythical aspect of it so 
that sort of exists within the realms of in Spirals, and it's a fantastic game. I love the mechanics, the the, the use of the American Sign Language, British Sign Language, to, to create that um, education and accessibility pieces is fantastic. Uh, but stepping aside from those of, of the other works you've written on, what has been your favorite? What has brought you the most joy that doesn't necessarily have to correlate to success? Because that's life. Uh, yeah, that's... Um... I think, I think, um, writing, I mean, it is back in the R series, writing for overalls was a, was a real joy to do because I did the vast majority of all the sort of narrative, um, parts, all the character sort of design and personalities, which is what I really enjoy doing. Um, in terms of stuff that I've been doing recently, I, I really enjoyed doing, um, the playbooks for Cryptid Creeks because again, mm. I'm sort of pushing myself doing something that I don't usually do. This is more to do with trying to figure out the mechanics of the game and whether mm -hmm. the special moves that each character has will actually work in terms of playing and whether they're too OP or whether they're attractive enough for players to want to, you know, pick that character, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so that's actually that's actually what I've really been enjoying at the moment. And my next task is to try and um, flesh out the, the town a little bit. So we're going to come up with sort of place names, a few key npcs um to start uh, navigators off um so yeah that's that's what i'm really really looking forward to doing in the future and sort of sinking my teeth into nice so sticking with cryptic creeks um oh. as it is uh the new project powered by apocalypse you said how much you, you've enjoyed the use of playbooks and learning um learning through play effectively with oh. with um this and sort of the blades in the dark sort of playbooks that exist and, and there's uh you mentioned monsters of the week as well monster of the week what out of the current cryptic creeks playbooks is your favorite and why oh you mean in terms which playbook is my favorite yeah mm, everyone's okay. got their favorite when they've created these things got their favorite. See, what sings if, to you if i was if i was being safe and what i usually go with i would say the conduit which is similar to the Whisper sort of character in, mm -hmm. in Blades um, in terms of they're the one who are more attuned um, to the creepy sort of side of things. But I don't know. I think I think I quite like the medic character, actually, okay. as well. And I think a lot of people will just because I think that playbook really appeals to people who thrive in a sort of a nurturing role. So a lot of their moves aren't necessarily to do with benefiting themselves mm. it is more to do with supporting the group and helping the group um much the same actually as the skipper is in a way the sort of elected leader of course they've got a few moves that benefit themselves but a lot of them are again rallying the group making sure everyone's okay making sure everyone's got sort of a clear direction of what they're going to be doing and stuff like that so yeah there's a few um I think Rich would probably say the stowaway. I do like the stowaway. That's our sort of roguish character. Um, mm. Very sneaky, um, hiding in the shadows, that sort of thing. So I think that'll be a lot of fun for people who like playing that sort of character. But um, yeah, I think I'm going to go, I'm going to, I'm going to go with the medic for that one. All yeah. right. All right. I'll keep an eye out for that when, when it comes out. <laughs> and so you mentioned uh, the medic and, uh, a few of the others have supportive uh, abilities, traits, uh, and things like that. So yeah. in that vein, where yeah. can we, the general populace listening in, where can we go to support you personally and Hatchling Games, please? Ah, well, we, we're on most of the various different social media sites <laughs> that have sprung up <laughs> since Twitter sort of started its downward trajectory so um we can be found on on twitter obviously hatchling dm is um rich's account that's doing most of our stuff mine is uh kessa bray with an underscore and bray spelled b-r-a-e um we're on facebook hatchlings games on facebook um we're on threads and instagram that's a fairly recent thing um that's actually run by me because rich can't get on to instagram because of some <laughs> sort of weird situation so i've had to run that one so again we're at hatchlings underscore games um there and then we're both on blue sky as well same sort of handle so kessa bray no underscore for me and hatchling jam um for rich so every, anything can be found um just looking up those two sort of handles on all the various socials and you should find us 
Um, I think I think we're on TikTok, but I, I think Rich <laughs> does that. Um, so yeah, probably search for if you search for hatchlings in TikTok, I'm sure something will come up. But um, yeah, they're they're our main ones. I'd say Twitter, Facebook, and Threads and Instagram so far, and Blue Sky. At, you know, tentatively. <laughs> All right. Well, I will make sure there are links down in the description below. So please scroll down, follow those links, support uh, Catherine and Hatchlings Games and all the things they do, the, the wonderful games they have produced thus far and the ones that are coming out in the future. Uh, I will make sure there are links down in the description. So please scroll down and follow. Uh, you mentioned being on places and TikTok and uh, wheeling all the way back uh drama and creative writing and things like that you've been creative for hatchlings games in another way uh using your using your voice uh so what has it been like to sort of lend your voice to projects that that now tens upon thousands potentially up to <laughs> hundreds or millions of people uh would have uh seen heard of uh and sort of what's it been like to put your voice out there as opposed to your written word um it's been it's been very it's been very strange it's been something i've had to get used to just because i'm one of these annoying people who don't like the sound of their voice hearing it back i don't know how mm. many people feel like that i think it must be quite common um but i just uh, <laughs> yeah i i just don't like it um but we we came to a point where we needed someone to do the voiceover and for mm. i think it was for an inspirals or overalls i can't remember which one it was but Rich had been trying to do it for literally weeks and he just couldn't, he couldn't get it quite right. He kept sort of stumbling and everything. Um, so I volunteered to do it because I had that sort of background in, in drama and that sort of thing. So I thought I might be able to give it a go. Mm -hmm. And I did. And it was OK. It took a, a little while to get used to it and making sure that each sort of take was quite clean and that I was, you know, not stumbling or tripping over things. Um, mm -hmm. But um, I don't know, I think maybe um, years of sort of reading aloud to the kids and stuff like that has helped um, with sort of being able to read off a sheet and it being quite sort of clear. Um, so it's been fun. I wouldn't say I listened to myself overly at all. Um, in fact, I had to leave the room when Rich was editing it because he just kept playing it. Obviously, as you'd have to do when you edit something, just kept playing it over and over again. So mm. I just I left the room. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> you just have fun with that. I'm I'm gonna go. <laughs> but um, but yeah, it's been it's been really interesting, and it's something I would like to sort of carry on with, just as long as I don't have to listen to the the finished product afterwards. I just send it off, and people can do what they want with it. <laughs> Mag magic happens in another kind of realm. Yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> So uh, that was for something that, that has been released and, and we've mentioned Cryptic Creeks is, is coming up, but uh, Hatchlings Games is, is sort of pulling is the wrong sort of expression, but moving in, in many directions, Dragon Dowser, uh, Argon, Nought uh, coming up. Uh, what's How heavily are you involved in, in these and, uh, game, future or forthcoming games, either that are being uh, crowdfunded or otherwise? And what has it been like sort of pushing your creativity into these other realms it's been it's been really good fun actually i've always been fairly creative in terms of writing so um you know i've dabbled in various different little sort of short story things that never really got finished but i enjoyed mm. just writing for the sake of writing um but it's been really great to actually have a project where you have to finish it and i can't just dabble and then just leave it you know i have mm -hmm. to actually finish it um so in terms of, yeah, in terms of writing, I'm not particularly involved with Argo Zero because that one is just rich, I think, mainly, and Kat, the law mistress, mm -hmm. um, because she's got, I believe, a very uh, keen interest in sort of the Greek mythology and everything. That's not something I know too much about, so I think I'm leaving that one, you know, to them. I might do a little bit of writing if, if they need it, but mm -hmm. I think they've probably got that one so not wait off yeah. um yeah so really it's going to be it's obviously cryptic creeks um i did the writing on dragon dowser and there's obviously dragon dowsers coming out i think it might be next year that we're kickstarting it and that's going to be an expanded version so much more like a full role-playing game rather than a solo journaling game sort of set okay. in the same um universe same lore but mm. a lot deeper um, than, than what you get introduced to in dragon dowser so I'm going to be writing a lot on that. I've actually also started tentative work on a novel set in that 
world as well um which is you know probably years and years off completion but um <laughs> it's been something fun just to sort of um dabble with because I, I really like that world and I think there's a lot that I can I can do with it um and then of course we've got Under Isles coming up um so I'll be doing most of the writing on that again now that the mechanics of those games are all sort of set mm. it's just going to be the narrative sort of side of things and um, that's going to be a lot of fun because it's it's to do with the uh the actual friends of the island rather than pen dragons so all these different creatures sort of are taking the taking the lead um yeah, so that's that's really sort of where I see it see it going um, at the moment, um, mm. and hopefully, hopefully, getting this novel sort of set up properly. <laughs> oh, amazing, uh, something to look forward to in the future, definitely. And I'd be interested, or well, I am interested, not just to be interested. I'm interested if, uh, as part of the, and, and I'll ask you about your creative process in the moment, but this sort of scratches that initial itch. Um, whether you use the the card system to help give you sort of writing prompts or do you have other ways of drawing from the source material that you've created um so it's actually it's an interesting thing i had i had in mind characters already and i had a vague sort of storyline using these characters and what i wanted to happen mm. but what i didn't really have was any sort of fleshed out world for them to exist in and i didn't really feel like creating sort of one off the top of my head you know and so i was saying this to rich you know sort of a few months ago i was um, discussing it and he said well why don't you use the dragon dowsers world because it would be amazing to have a novel come out using you know the dragon dowsers world mm. and i thought about it and i was like actually that could really work because i was already thinking about it being in sort of set in a world that was in conflict and obviously in dragon dowsers it's a sort of almost like a civil a civil conflict between the rulers mm. of the land and, and the renegades who are trying to protect the um the dragons so and then of course i, I thought i'll get to write a novel with dragons in it um which is awesome but then i started worrying that it was going to turn out too much like game of thrones um which i haven't actually ever watched so hopefully or read so hopefully i won't get too you know sort of too influenced yeah. influenced by it but it you know it was everywhere obviously a couple of mm. years or so ago so but um yeah, I think uh, I think that's that's really where it sort of came from. So I, I I don't think I'd use the prompts too much, but but for some for some little extra scenes they might come in useful. I think or just remembering like oh yes we put that on the prompt so maybe I could bring that sort of location in. You know that mm. that mystic waterfall that sort of helps you out and gives you a clue or something like that. So. But yeah, it's going to be a little bit of a departure from the actual journaling game, um, yeah. just using using that world, I think. No, it's amazing. And you mentioned there sort of using prompts and things like that. So if you don't mind me asking and, and digging just a little bit, <laughs> what is your creative or writing process? If someone hears this and they've already thought, I'd, like, I'd love to write within a game world, maybe a supplement, maybe um, maybe a full game of their own... <sighs> What was what has been your process, and and how do you go from idea to written word to final product in in that respect? Uh, well, it it sort of for me, I have to I have to be in the mood to do it. I think if I if I ever sort of sit down and I'm not in the mood, I will just end up staring at my computer screen for ages, just you know staring at a blinking cursor, not doing anything. Um, so for a start, I have to make sure that I'm in the right mood because if not, then nothing's going to happen. And then I just feel a bit um, deflated that mm. I haven't got anything written down. Um, I always try and write down any sort of ideas that come to me, like when I'm out and about or whatever, I try and write them down on my phone just so I can get them down when I get home. But most of the time, I if I'm in that mood and I'm in the sort of the, the zone, as it were, I'll just sit down and I'll write and I'll actually edit as I go. And I know a lot of people don't do that. Um, mm. they rather just get the words down and then the editing is a whole process and it still is for me but I don't I actually do edit to a certain degree as I go just because I don't I don't like having it too rough um, mm. and it also gives me a chance to sort of go back over it and be like oh that could that could do with changing or oh, that's that's not a good sentence you know stuff like that so um I do that. Sometimes I still think it's all rubbish and I'll just delete it um, and start again. I think every writer has those moments where they just throw a sort of temper tantrum, just be like, it's all, it's all rubbish, get rid of it all. But yeah, no, I, I, I try and start off with a, a decent character, a decent idea of where I want things to go mm. and how did the characters get there. 
and that's that's basically it. you've got your end point and you've got your people involved and it's just, and then everything else can just be built around around that really I think getting a good balance between dialogue and description is also quite good because sometimes you can be really bogged down by describing stuff and there's not really any chat in between any of the characters or you can go the other way and all they do is chat and hmm. you don't know where they are or what's surrounding them. So a nice balance is always good. But I think everyone's got everyone's got their different way of writing. I don't think you can write wrong. I don't, I don't think you can do do it wrong. Um, you just have to do what, what works for you um, and trial and error, I suppose. Amazing. All right. Well, I hope that helps somebody I can uh, at times lack the focus and the discipline almost required to consign words to page or the sort of the computer screen as it were but uh, maybe i'll find time and have a stab at it in the future as it were as as it goes um so we've spoken about D and and how you've sort of primarily played up to a point and you've experienced uh sort of the play testing side of things getting the, the inspirals into place um blades in the dark is is a game and, and you mentioned Mon- monster of the week mm. uh, is there anything that other games or settings you would love to sort of try and play in or experience um beyond the ones that we've, we've already mentioned um in the future yeah i think i think there's a few um i know that there's a few that come out on kickstarter um fairly recently that the rich has backed um i can't remember the names of them off the top of my head but there have definitely been a couple that we're like oh yeah absolutely want to do that um there's one that I saw recently, which was um, sort of the Ponies of Equestria or something like that, the little, My Little Pony one. And oh, yeah. just because I think my kids would love it and it might be a good way to get them into role-playing games. Um, they've obviously tried some of it. They've played some of our games, sort of hmm. playtesting them to a certain degree. But I think that's a game that they could, you know, really sort of um, get their teeth into as well. Um, so that just, yeah, just because of that. And there's also Kids on Bikes, which also looked amazing. So, yeah, I'm really keen on doing that at some mm. point as well. Um, but just, I, I really want to just sort of, yeah, it's explore lots of different, um, what's the word? Lots of different mechanics, lots of different um, types of role-playing games. So it's not just powered by the apocalypse. So you get to broaden the horizons a little bit more. I've not tried Pathfinder, but that's another one that might be, might be quite fun to try. Um, but, uh, yeah, so lots of so many different creators done so many different amazing products and Mm. it can be quite hard sometimes to try and keep up with all the new stuff that's that's coming out but i think it's just a testament to how talented a load of people are like Mm. there's there's one that comes out nearly sort of every month or every couple of months and it's just oh, it's amazing idea amazing idea so i think there's kakira as well is it which the which one that's coming out soon um i can't remember if it's pretty sure it's sort of it's very um kiki's delivery service yes uh, yeah um but that that looked amazing as well so i'd be quite keen to try that it's gone the name's gone but i know exactly the one you yeah mean. i think it's something like kakiro K- or something like that hmm. um but yeah we rich and i've been eyeing that for a little while that looks and we well, both love kiki so yeah. <laughs> so uh, w- all right that that leads nicely on to the next so away from uh game mechanics game writing content creation kickstarting crowdfunding business taxes and all that sort of stuff what do you do to relax how do you unwind how do you just sort of switch off and enjoy your time if you don't Um, mind me asking no that's fine i'm a big i'm a big fan of um just gaming in general so I tend to do PC games more than sort of PlayStation. Um, so usually I do Stardew Valley or Sims. I think there's nothing better almost for me to relax than Stardew Valley because by its very nature, you just potter around and, mm. you know, water your crops and go and fish and there's no real rush to do anything. And it just the slow pace of it just helps me. Um, I also really like doing um, colouring as well. Like I'm not an artist, but I love the colouring books um, because I just find them very therapeutic. And yeah. I also love Lego, but it's a really expensive hobby, so I don't get to <laughs> indulge too often. But um, Rich got me an amazing set um, for Mother's Day a year or so ago, and I spent ages assembling it. Um, wow. And I don't know, there's something about that, sort of the routine of it, just sitting mm. down and assembling each bit, bit by bit, just uh, really appeals to that sort of very pragmatic, linear part of me, I suppose, where, mm. yes, you do that and you follow the instruction, then you... So, 
yeah, love love doing that. But as I say, it's a bit expensive. I usually end up stealing the kids' Lego sets that they've forgotten <laughs> and just doing them <laughs> instead. Less play well and more pay more, I think, at this point in time with Lego. <laughs> yeah. So, and and thank you for, for sharing those the, those um, moments and, and uh, how you sort of decompress maybe or, or unwind from, from yeah. the... the the, the I, I imagine sizable pressures to sort of continue to create content, um, push out things on a promotional level as well as a business level, um, adhering to sort of expectations from investors. Yeah, I suppose that's a fair mm. way of, of saying it. Those who are backed at various projects. Um, so how staying on that, that line, that, that train of thought, how have you found the crowdfunding process? It has clearly supported your games and fantastic oh, yeah. games they are. Um, <laughs> but how have you found that process? Um, I mean, to be honest, it started off quite quite tough, I think, with Inspirals because we mm. were so new to it. Um, we didn't really know what to expect. Um, Inspirals obviously ended up funding and funding fairly like a fair way over um what we'd ask for but we were yeah just completely completely new to it there's a, a lot of um pressures from people who who back a game and might not sort of understand the way that kickstarter works um mm. so you know the fact that you, you've pledged the money you're not going to get the product immediately um and then of course there's um shipping money that comes in afterwards and a lot of people don't understand that they're then having to pay the shipping money afterwards so there, there's been a lot of times where, by by and large, our comments and, and people who've, who've pledged have been amazingly supportive, like amazing people, very, very understanding when there have been delays. Um, I know, you know, there were massive um, delays with Inspirals because of, um, well, COVID. Um, mm -hmm. And then also the whole thing with shipping, um, just sort of <laughs> everything stopped, basically. Yeah. Um, yeah. So everyone was very understanding about that um but you do get a few comments every so often from people who are you know losing patience or thinking that they're not going to get their product and it's mm. for us it was just trying to learn not to take that as a personal attack because obviously it's not um it's not intended to be it's just someone wanting to know where their stuff is and it's just yeah. having to having to sort of take a step back be like it's okay just respond and say it is on the way you will get it we promise and it's just that keeping that communication open i think as long as you keep the communication open that's the most important thing with crowdfunding um between a creator and the backers because yeah. if if people go silent, if a creator goes silent, of course, backers are going to wonder what on earth has happened and if they are going to get what they paid for and um, what's happened to the project, is it still on track, that sort of thing. So even if projects, and a lot of them do, a lot of them do hit snags and sort of um, problems that delay it, I think the vast majority of people who use Kickstarter or other crowdfunding sites are understanding about that, mm -hmm. that you need to have that communication. They need to have that reassurance that, yeah, I'm really sorry. This is what's happened. This is where we are. And as long as you do that, it's mostly absolutely fine. But as I say, we've we've been blown away by the support that we've got from people for the games. So really, I mean, I think um, crowdfunding, you know, when it's done, you know, um, sort of well, you know, through a really well designed Kickstarter page and stuff like that, like we've seen some amazing Kickstarter pages mm -hmm. that really just grab you instantly. Um, it can it can really really work but I think there are also a lot of amazing products that might not get made because the kickstarter page for whatever reason doesn't grab people and that's that's really frustrating mm. um, for people that you know who have a great idea but they might not be able to get the page looking perfect and people yeah. just they don't have any attention span when they're scrolling through kickstarter and it's just like oh you know they'll just scroll past and that's that's really frustrating I've seen that happen to a few really really promising products um so yeah just that really um i think there's there's pitfalls to it but i think overall it's it's a really good way to to get your games out there and all your products out there um without having to go through other other channels that might be less receptive to creative choices and things yeah yeah definitely so you know we, we've talked about your games your voiceover work uh, your writing process, the the future novel in the Dragon Dowser world, uh, yeah. definitely caught my attention. That so uh, looking forward to to when that finally comes to yeah, a book we, probably uh, be uh, years. We, yeah, yeah, it's all good. Um, we have time, and the creative process takes as long as it takes, and that's as you say, as long as there's patience and and understanding, then that's fine. 
Um, but is there anything that we haven't spoken about in this interview so far that you want to bring up now? Um, no, I don't. I think I think we've we've covered most of it, to be honest. Um, yeah, I think I think we've done we've done everything. Um, I'm pretty pretty happy with everything, really. <laughs> I can't uh, think. There's like an interview when they ask a well, it is an interview, but when they ask me, you know, have you got any other questions? I'm just <laughs> yeah. like, no, I'm I'm pretty happy, honestly. <laughs> no, that's well, I'm I'm glad, you know, because uh I want to you to I want us to be able to understand all the things going on with uh Hatchling Games and understand a bit more about you your good self and, and your processes and all those sorts of good things. So I, I didn't want to leave anything left off the table, as it were, in that respect. Um so if you are content, um yeah. Catherine, where can we find you and Hatchlings Games on social media and the internet, please? Well, we're pretty much all over the place, to be honest. Um, <laughs> we are on nearly, well, not all of the different socials. We're on a lot of the big ones. Um, mm. So Twitter, Facebook, Threads, Instagram, Blue Sky, a little bit on TikTok, but not a huge amount. Um, you can find um, me. I'm usually under Kessa Bray, um, sometimes with an underscore between Kessa and Bray, sometimes not. Uh, Rich is obviously Hatchlings DM. Um, and then I run the, the threads and the Instagram. So that's just Hatchlings underscore games. So you can keep up with everything that we're doing um, on there as well. I will make sure there are links down in the description below. So please scroll down, follow those links and support Catherine uh, Hatchlings Games and all the amazing work they're doing um, and back one of their fantastic projects that are going on I imagine right now because you <laughs> yeah. always have something amazing in the pipeline always something to there be supported. Always, always something to be working on yeah <laughs> and I'd love to get you back on uh, the show in the future if you'd be willing to come oh, back yeah. and join me uh, to discuss any of the number of projects under ours being being an example uh coming up in the future if of course you'd be willing to come back and join me of course yeah i've had a blast amazing well i will well we will get that organized outside of this in, uh, particular interview yeah. and it has been such a pleasure to talk to you oh, today. thank you so much adam it's been a pleasure to be on thank you so much catherine thank you thank you for listening if you'd like to learn more about the show then go to www.snidersreturn.squarespace Com. Alternatively, you can find us over on Twitter, at Return Snyder. We have a link tree link in the description of this episode. And if you want to support us, come and join us over on Patreon, and we also have a Discord server. Uh, please leave us a review, because we'd love to learn how to improve the channel and provide better content out for, for those who are listening. Uh, until, we, uh, until we speak again, thank you. <laughs>